The webinar is now live. Hi, everybody. How are you guys? Oh, we're good. <laughs> good you today. Happy Tuesday. Happy um, Tuesday. Welcome to those of you who joined us. Um, I'm Diana Graber. I'm the author of Raising Humans in a Digital World and the founder of CyberWise and CyberCivics. I'm here today. Okay, where are you guys? Pamela Rutledge is below me, I think, on my screen. That's where she appears. She's the director mm -hmm. of the Media Psychology Research Center. And to my whatever side he's on, he's on my left on my screen, <laughs> is Rick Andrioli, and he's Hello. the editor in chief of Parentology. And below him or below me, <laughs> down there somewhere, is Arias Collins, and she is the community manager of CyberWise and CyberCivics. Um, Arias will be manning our chat box today or womaning our chat box today. So if you have any questions as we go along, um, please put them in there because she has every uh, opportunity to interrupt us and ask those questions as we're addressing that topic. And we really love to do that to make this useful to, for all of you. So um, Arias, feel free to interrupt. And um, all right, well, without further ado, let me see if I have any house cleaning stuff to do. I don't think so. We'll get started. So um, as you know, if you're here, we're talking about chat apps today. And in case you hadn't all noticed uh, in the last crazy over year that we've had in the pandemic, uh, many of us have turned to technology in order to keep in touch with family and friends. So digital technologies that allow us to chat have gone off. And the most obvious one is the one we're using right now, which is Zoom, which has saved so many of us and allowed us to do things like this, teach classes, etc. But the reason we settled on this topic for today is we're really fascinated about this one new app that is called Clubhouse that is suddenly hugely popular with adults. Um, for those of you who don't know what it is, it's an audio only social platform where users enter different rooms to listen in on or participate in conversations. Um, at the moment, Clubhouse is an iPhone only app and you can only use it if you're invited by another user. Um, despite that limitation or these limitations and it barely a year old, believe it or not, it's been downloaded almost 13 million times. Um, but what's weird about it is despite the name, I mean, parents hear the name Clubhouse and we think, you know, kids are playing in it, right? It's an adult <laughs> playground, which is so weird to me because it's so absolutely simple. So we really wanted to address that today. Um, as an aside, I asked, I've got two kids and I asked my 21 year old if she had heard of Clubhouse, she never heard of it. I asked my other daughter if she'd heard of it and she said, yeah, but it, there's no dancing on it. So why would kids want to use it? So <laughs> you, you know, but it, it's weird in this year that when we've canceled like most live events and conferences and job fairs, a lot of adults are turning to Clubhouse to rub elbows with peers. So to give us a little reason why because that's why pam's here give us the psychology behind that Pam. why well, what is with clubhouse and it's what is with clubhouse well first of all i just want to clarify something you said because it's an adult app which means that it is for people mostly over 18 not that it's particularly exciting although there might be some excited things going on um, I think of uh, Clubhouse as being somewhere between a participatory podcast and the sort of LinkedIn version of WhatsApp. It's very unstructured. That allows you people to sort of stumble into new things, which is increasingly hard in our algorithm-driven world. It's an extrovert's paradise. I hated it, needless to say. But if you're willing to put yourself out there, you can find people of similar interests. However, in spite of this sort of grandiose, we're experts for hobnobbing with sort of Elon Musk kind of attitude, it's really fueled by some very basic psychology, which is to say, people are naturally curious. This curiosity works at a bunch of different levels. This is exclusive. Who's in? Who's out? How do I become in? How do I feel good enough about myself that someone will let me in? So there's this whole very basic psychology going on because of the exclusivity. The other thing is that once you're in, you can go down these rabbit holes. Well, if I'm in, if these are people that have been invited in, why are they important? Who's the moderator in this room? Why is it called the stage? Are they really important? You go look at their profiles and then you sort of track back through all of their bits of their bios. It turns out because of that, bio writing is a huge deal on Clubhouse and people will actually write them for you for a price. The other thing that I noticed is that it's becoming a very, pardon? There's a job. Yeah, right. Writing your uh, clubhouse <laughs> bio has become, there's a, this monetization push is huge, right? Where people are putting themselves, you know, to connect with me offline. This is what I do. I'm an expert in this. So it's, it's um, 
it's a huge platform for people doing self-promotion, taking some of that halo effect from people who were actually famous when this all started. Um, it's audio. You don't have to get dressed. You don't have to brush your hair. It has all of those advantages of Zoom with no camera. And it allows you to eavesdrop without feeling guilty. So it's become sort of the, the go-to way to procrastinate and not feel so guilty as watching crazy cat videos as well as something you could do while walking the dog because it is, as you said, mobile um, on the Apple and uh, portable. Yeah, so the thing that I thought was interesting about that that you mentioned is the fact that there's no algorithms so you can bump into something new. And when you think about it, there's so few places like that left on the internet because they know so much about us. I think that's super fascinating. And I think that might be the draw. And I, I for me personally, it's the fact that you can go on Clubhouse and not feel like Narcissus staring at yourself all day. You know? So you can Well, just, yeah, that is a plus. It's like just so nice to not have to like, you know, uh, as you've heard me say before, brush your hair or even like I put on a necklace today. That's like totally dressing up for me. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so well, it's a, I'm it's sorry. a great time to join it because so many people are new. I was yeah. just cruising around yesterday in anticipation of this, and there were several uh, rooms just discussing tips on using Clubhouse from people who were new. Uh, and, you know, so I think that it's a very friendly in that sense. Like I said, you need to be an extrovert. You need to be willing to speak up. But um, so um, I have a question for you, Rick. And, you know, yes. for those of you who are unfamiliar with parentology, they have articles on literally everything. <laughs> They have covered it all. I don't know. You must have like a hundred writers or something. But um, Clubhouse is that one that you covered? Since it is primarily an adult app. Yeah. So we covered it uh, when it first came out. I just republished it to the homepage of the website. Um, and the key things there is that yes, the only people that are really talking about it are adults. And in my experience, it's a lot of people in the marketing space. Yeah. Um, the chances of a young person getting in there, yeah, they can lie. There's no stopping them from lying about their age and getting in, but there's also nothing there for them in terms of like, there are far easier ways for young people to chat with one another than Clubhouse. So we don't see it particularly as a risky place for young people um, per se compared to other chat apps or, or, um, or apps or sites, yeah. I, I would agree with you, Rick, and, you know, but parents should know, I mean, or people should know that you can make private rooms. And mm -hmm. while you can't actually record in Clubhouse, there are lots of ways to record on your phone, just like every other app that, you know, there is no privacy, just assume there is no privacy ever, um, and you will be um, smarter for it. Yeah, and there's the lookalikes coming. I mean, LinkedIn yeah. just announced that it's creating a Clubhouse-like app. A lot of the other apps are doing Clubhouse. I mean, when one thing becomes popular, then other things pop up. And I think that's what mm -hmm. we're starting to see. So, you know, just keep aware that those things will happen and kids might be curious because they'll see these places happening everywhere, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we don't want to spend too much time on Clubhouse unless there are any, any questions, Arias. Did we have any questions pertaining to Clubhouse? Not yet, no. Let us know if you if we do, but it kind of got us thinking about all these ways that not just adults, but kids particularly are connecting. And it's funny to use the term chat apps because literally every app is a chat app for a kid. <laughs> like, yeah. they're, on it, they're gonna chat because that's their job. Their job is to be social, to connect with their peers, to figure out who they are and to grow, right? And so mm -hmm. I see it, you know, teaching kids, they'll be on Google Classroom chatting. And I've seen kids even, on YouTube, watching a YouTube for school, chatting with each other via the discussion on YouTube. So, you know, that's what we're gonna talk about today, but I do wanna focus in on one app that I'm still recovering from because I used it last night and it is pretty shocking, a Megal, because we've been hearing a lot about that. And Rick, I know you guys just did a really great story on it. Do you wanna explain what, what it is? Yeah, and and uh, so um, a Megal is a site that lets people talk to strangers. And in itself, <laughs> that, yeah, but it, it's, um, here's the thing. It is one click away from adult content. And that's not an exaggeration. That is not me creating panic in the world. Um, you go to the site and there are two big buttons that say text or video chat. And allegedly that's monitored. There's also then the button that says 18 and over, not monitored. 
And if you click that, you immediately go, it's very similar to chat roulette, um, which was big back in the day where people will cruise one another online by showing off their bodies right now. Yes, we can just talk online, but like with any of those sort of hookup apps, it's not like that. It's, it's really about it, exhibitionists and voyeurs wanting to see adult content. And that's, that's exactly what you get there. And literally it is one click away for a kid to go on there. Yeah, well, yeah and we scary. mean adult in the true sense of the word this time, not in just. Oh no, this is, this is full on pornography. There's no arguing it. Yeah. yeah. What's weird to me is you don't even have to download anything. Um, no. I went on it last night and, with my daughter and literally, like you say, you go to the website and I started with text thinking that would be easy and immediately got asked personal information, which, you know, there's a concern. Kids will give that away, you know, if, if they don't know. And then I went, like you said, there's a tab say, oh, if you want the adult site, click here. And the warning is like, if you're under 18, sexual material is illegal. If you do not want to see it, don't press here. Well, of course a kid's gonna, like, if you're a kid, come on, here's a Playboy magazine. If you right. don't see it, just let me know. I mean, so they're gonna go in and you go in and it's like, well, Lori, you know, for me, it was like crazy stuff that I saw. I couldn't take it. So I had to call my therapist. No, I'm just kidding. No. But, you know, and it just, it oh, even, it even has a notice that says, um, warning, uh, child predators have been known to be on this site. And if you want to block it, there are uh, browser plugins that you can use. Well, that's basically saying, okay, we've told you you're going to get in trouble here. So yeah. we're out. We're safe. Yeah. It's all and, it's all on you. Good luck, parents. And so, right, yeah. there, uh, sorry, Pam. Uh, oh, no, no, that's fine. At Omegle would respond to us just as an FYI. That, that we've talked about this earlier. Whenever there's an app or a site that you don't need to worry about, they're willing to talk to us. <laughs> so they nobody there did yeah, yeah. so well, i just going to say that we're we'll get into a little bit later but the fact that there is that appeal that diana was yeah. just talking about means that this is not one of those apps that is, you're going to be successful saying don't go here yeah. in other words you really need to prepare your kids because yeah. i guarantee you at some slumber party or some something <laughs> they're gonna they're gonna try it out just for fun so they need to be prepared so that's exactly my question to you, Pam. What is it, obviously, what is it that kids like about it? Oh, well, there's, I mean, first <laughs> of all, I mean, we talked about this the other day that it's beginning there, a lot of notoriety because influencers are using it for creating YouTube videos and TikTok videos. So hashtag Omegle on TikTok or YouTube will take you to some uh, video where uh, James Charles, the, you know, the beauty influencer is, you know, going through person after person asking them how to pick up makeup or um, Emma, uh, what, Emma Champlin uh, was doing a, a Meagle birthday party where she was going through person by person and decorating cupcakes. The good news is they, you know, they do show you to just move on if you get to the um, content that Rick was talking about. But the bad news is they make it almost seem like a TikTok challenge. I mean, it becomes, I mean, it, you know, it, they show people having a lot of fun, which really um, sort of hides the darker side, I think. Yeah. You know, you were joking about this earlier, but it's true. We were talking about Omega last week and one of my daughters was here and she said, oh yeah, remember chat relay, roulette. And chat roulette is sort of the precursor to Omegle. It's the same concept that you would go on and they would give you a random stranger. She goes, oh yeah, we did that at a slumber party once when I was in junior high and we saw this guy show his, you know, private parts and all this. I'm like, what? You're just telling me this 10 years later? You know, why did I not know about this? So this is like, think about if you're a kid, you're at a slumber party, how fun would it be to just go look at this pornography together? So, you know, I'm laughing here and you know, it is sort of funny, but on the other hand, it's tough for a parent because it's like, you don't want to say don't do it because like Pam said, it's the first thing they're going to do. But I think for a parent, knowledge is power, knowing about this thing, you know, bringing it up in conversation and like, gosh, can you believe that there's this thing and da da da, let's talk about it. Because, you know, it might be shocking for a kid to see this stuff and they may need someone to discuss, you know, this. Right. And then take it even one step further, Diana, and say, what would, what would you do? You know, if, if the X happened, you know, how would you, what would be a good solution for that? So that they've had a little bit of uh, sort of planning or 
yeah. role playing so that yeah. they, um, because one thing that we talked about the other day is the fact that these influencers are using it. It's a little bit like Clubhouse. You go on and maybe you're going to meet Elon Musk. Well, and here, maybe they're going to meet an influencer that they know and love. Random chance. The best way to change behavior, the casinos all know this, is by inconsistent rewards. You know, it's the promise of rewards, but you never know when you're going to get it, which makes this very appealing. So that's so interesting is like the parallels here between this adult app Clubhouse and the kid app Omegle. Like, you know, there are some very basic human needs that they're both satisfying, you know, on both ends of the spectrum, which I think is really interesting. Just a quickie definition for, for people in case parents are now panicked. Um, so you can only <laughs> really access it on a browser. So that's either on a computer or on the browser on the phone, but there is no actual app that can be downloaded anymore. My understanding is there was one at one time, but we couldn't find it. So, so parents just should know that don't, you don't, if you're scroll, scrolling through your kid's phone, you want to go to their browser. They're not. A, is that supposed to make parents less panicked? Well, I think that if they could be looking in the wrong spot is really the, the concern for me. In other words, don't look for any telltale signs because you won't know unless you yeah, unless you know how to look at browser history. But to, to your point, Rick, I mean, I think it's really good to know as much about an app where you have a concern as possible. But there is no way to protect your kid from because you aren't with them 24 seven. You don't know what computer, what phone, whatever. So you really have to talk to them and you have to talk honestly and you have to prepare them because you know the world is full of kind of creepy stuff you know always has been you know we just maybe see it a little bit more now uh -huh. so let me stop for a second Arius or were there some questions in the chat box unfortunately my technology seems to be having an issue every time I put in a link it shoots me off of zoom so I'm not sure if oh, our chat app, it has a little bug here, but I've reported the problem, but. Okay, technology, gotta love it. Gotta I'm, it. Seeing, <laughs> I'm seeing your two uh, posts though in the chat. Oh, good. Okay. So there are two I'm in not, there. Okay, but every time I do, I get kicked off uh, and I want to hear all this juicy <laughs> conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, for those of you who don't know, we post this afterwards um, on the CyberWise website and share it widely via social media. And we're always available to answer questions. So don't mm -hmm. feel free to contact us in the many ways that you can you can via technology. All right, so I'm gonna move on here because we did get a question from my friend, Erin, um, who runs Media Literacy Now, which is a terrific organization that advocates for media literacy in schools. I couldn't say enough good things about them, but she asked a great question. Um, how is it the teens won't call anyone ever, won't talk on the phone, but will chat with strangers on the apps. There must be some psychology here. Right, Pam? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, if you think about all of us who grew up with phones, right, back in the day, they used to actually be hooked to the wall, right? And we think of a phone as being a vehicle for talking. We do not approach communication technology and devices as what do I want to do and what does it best? And so if you think about what it is that kids are trying to do at any given point, connect with multiple friends, share an image, share a thought or a feeling, do something together, talking on the phone is not the way to get that done best. So you, so if it's a question of what are they trying to do? Because certainly there are times when having a phone conversation is helpful. A lot of the communication that teens do is group oriented and is not need to have a voice involved. Now, that being said, the, the Omegle, that's yeah that's chat it's video chat it's however you want to do it but it's generally speaking groups of people doing it for fun and entertainment you know it's like an experimentation a little peek at the dark side so it's not um, a serious uh, communication tool um, rick have you guys addressed that topic on parentology that would be a great topic it would be a good one yeah the, why kids are, are drawn to these things yeah or why they're not talking on phones Right. Yeah. Please. I, I, I can barely get my interns to pick up the phone, much less. Yeah. And they're in college. Like. Yeah, I've, ha I've heard that um, high school and college teachers have had to teach the students how to use the telephone, which is. But why? But why? I mean, that's like, why would you why would you want them to use the phone? In other words. Do you yeah. know what I'm saying? In other words, why not start with what they're trying to do first? Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. 
And I know in my own home, I never pick up the phone because I'm like, well, why, why is this someone calling me? They should just text me. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, so the one advantage I would say to Clubhouse is that emotion comes through voice. And so if you're not seeing someone and can contrast to text, which does have an opportunity for some misunderstandings or email, voice has the opportunity to express emotion, sarcasm, right. you know, all of that kind of thing. So there are advantages to voice. In the case of Clubhouse, it makes people feel more connected because voices are visceral and we respond to them physiologically. Interesting. All right. So um, let me get to our net. We get, got another question. This one's from Amy. Oh, this is a good one. Uh, wondering if you have any data on the boredom factor of COVID social isol isolation as a contributing factor of teen outreach and how much traction, what ages, et cetera. So I think that question is really speaking to why is this stuff so popular right now during coronavirus? I think it, the obvious is we crave social connection. I mean, if we didn't have this stuff, it would be so lonely and it's a great time to explore. And that's what kids like to do, connecting with their peers on different apps and also hiding from parents. You know, So many parents think they know what's going on if they check their kids' text messages, but kids aren't really texting stuff as much as they're chatting within Snapchat or Instagram or whatever, wherever they are, they're finding right. to communicate with their friends. And they, these are all new, exciting things to try out. So. I, well, I found some two sort of interesting factoids. Uh, one is that, yes, you know, we all know media use has gone up. I mean, we're on school, we're working from home. I mean, it would be crazy if it had not. What's really interesting is in spite of this increase, it the increase sort of goes up and down with the surges of the economy being open and closed. So it really does track along with that. But the distribution of use isn't really any different. In other words, I, I might, you know, I'm watching TV more, but it's the same amount of my time that I was doing that before. I'm on computers the same amount, but, you know, I mean more, but not more than in a distribution sense. So I thought that was very interesting that it wasn't like everybody just rushed over to Netflix and abandoned all the other devices. The other thing that I think is really important for, for parents to think about when, especially parents who are now worried about, which I hear all the time, and I know we all do, about kids being addicted to technology because of COVID and they have no other choices is how important social connection is to people's mental and physical health. Yeah. And so places wow. like New Zealand have defined social bubbles in different kinds of ways than we have. We've just told everybody to go home and stay with their family. So we've got all these kids at home with their parents. They're having a ball, right? <laughs> Who they most would want, want to hang out with is their friends, right? That's their social bubble. So what they're doing is creating their social bubble using technology in the way that other places have allowed people to expand the physical contact to create social bubbles in a um, different kind of way. So I think what they're seeing is that that's super important. It isn't how many people you're hanging out with, it's who you're hanging out with. Exactly. So I, I do see, I don't know if Arius is able to see the chat box, but I do see a question there. If any panelists have had experience with the chat app Emerald. Rick, have no. you heard Emerald? I don't, I just quickly, uh, I was looking it up. Um, so it says Emerald is the new Omegle. That's literally their selling point. I would, I would click in, except we might start hearing it over the chat app. So, so but I've written it down, uh, Erica, to to do a dive into it, and I can have our same writer who did Omegle okay. uh, look into this. And I tell you, you gotta really stay on top of this stuff because there's just you must have a hardy reporter who looked into Omegle. Oh, I had to apologize to her. I was a. <laughs> Cause I was like, yeah, I felt horrible once I saw it. And she was like, no, because as a parent, she wants to know what her kids could be getting into. So wow. for her diving in is, is, is a thing. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. So. You... Oh, and then, sorry, uh, Diana, Catherine also had a question for Pam. Okay. Uh, Pam, do you feel like the lack of physical communication, the younger generation or experience are going to affect their future tactic in the way they communicate with others when they reach adulthood and are forced to interact physically in their career paths? Uh, I mean, yes and no. In other words, think about who they're going to be working with, other people who grew up when they did, right? In other words, there are different social norms and different rules of behavior over time that shift. Will it hurt them? No, it won't. They're learning to navigate the environment that they live in 
So as long as what they're doing is balanced, as long as they're not spending 24 seven on Twitch or you know, only ever spending their time making TikTok videos, as long as it's balanced, I have no concerns at all because kids grow up, right? They get mature, they use things in different kinds of ways. We just don't understand what's motivating them at a specific time to use it in a specific way because we're not that age anymore. Okay, I'm gonna have I'm gonna give the counterpoint to Pam here. Sorry, Pam. Okay. <laughs> we do this a lot. <laughs> but I, I do worry a little bit because I think, you know, I have heard from so many colleagues that teach high school and college age students that they it's it's becoming more common to run across young people who just don't aren't able to have a face-to-face -face conversation. They're uncomfortable with it and they're not as conversational and all the things that you want people a well-rounded person to be so I do agree with Pam that that balance is important but I would love to see us tip the balance a little more towards personal interaction and I do worry about kids especially our youngest kids that have been so behind a screen and not having that personal interaction because those are the social emotional skills that give us the foundation to be a great human and it's very important so as much as we can do to return kids to normal and having that face-to-face -face interaction I think is just imperative right now I think you're right, but I wonder, Diana, how much of this is also a little bit of an extension. When I was a kid, right, it was just out the door, run around, nobody cared where you went, you climbed a tree, you broke, you know, you broke your leg, you whatever, but you weren't monitored. When my kids were little, we were paying much more attention, they had a much more regimented thing, they were not allowed to, you know, stranger danger, all that, kids didn't roam free on the, on the sidewalk, so we've actually constrained that kind of exploration. Yeah. So what technology has allowed kids to do is regain that yeah. unencumbered sense of freedom. So some of this, I think, is a result of the constraints that change in societies, changing safety levels, changing parental concerns, overzealous parents, who knows what, have, have put in place. But I agree with you, those are important skills. I'm just not concerned about, I'm much more concerned about other things and other values than I am whether or not they can talk to each other. Um, and it's funny too, because, you know, going outside, we'd be worried about meeting a stranger on the street. And it's like now, okay, you're going to meet hundreds of thousands of strangers on the street and some of them will be naked <laughs> during this information <laughs> and using hate speech and maybe cyberbullying. So yeah, it's a little, little different. Um, all right, so Rick, you shared with us some really great other apps, chat apps that kids are using right now that are very popular. Um, can you give us a quick rundown? I know you guys have covered almost all of these. Do you have a, a, a top five list that you want to share with us? Right. So yeah, um, maybe a top four, we'll call it. Um, so Signal is one that uh, allows encrypted conversations. And the thing about that that is worrisome is that if uh, a young person is communicating with somebody uh, who has not so genuine interest, right? Um, it's encrypted, so it's harder to trace things. The uh, It rose to popularity during the George Floyd protests uh, so that organizers could keep the communication going private, uh, unlike on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok, right? Uh, which were mon being monitored by law enforcement. So uh, is Signal still going? It's still going, but is it huge? That's, you know, it kind of depends. Again, people move from one thing to the other. Remember when Snapchat was the hottest thing and now it's TikTok, right? Um, young people move around. Um, Yubu is another one. It's being called the Tinder for teenagers, which beyond the alliteration, I think is um, something that uh, law enforcement is using to create a little bit of panic in it. Um, it comes down to what Pam talked about earlier. You know, yes, it's a way for young people to meet and quote date or flirt or whatever. But if you give your kid the tools of like, this is appropriate, this is not, then is it a real threat, right? Like, you know what I mean? Um, the people I'm who have called you for just one yeah. second, because somebody wrote, "What's it called?" It's actually oh. Yubo Y U B O. Yeah, here. Where's that? Oh. Pamela did it. Thank you, Pamela. Beecha. You did. Um, and uh, with that one, uh, I almost feel like the people that are calling it Tinder for teenagers are people who are wanting to create a panic around it. Y you know what I mean? Like, like 
because but it sounds really good let me tell you when whenever you put tinder for teenagers in a headline we get a lot of clicks so um kick is another one it's been around for a while um the the thing with kick that is interesting and why a lot of the monitoring apps cover it is that you're not sure if you're being messaged by a human or a bot um and if you believe what the comments are saying in the um in the app stores it's used with a lot of young people for sexting now sexting so that they can do it there without the parents seeing it on their phone okay i don't know um you know you, you, there's no way to verify the the truth of that you just have to go and assume that the parent leaving that comment is telling the truth uh the last one which is an interesting one not really a chat app so much it, it, it is in that you can start chats there but spoon radio which is sort of a clubhouse meets youtube it's where young people 13 and over can start their own radio station basically and it could be them talking about manga and anime or makeup or whatever they want. Um, but at the same time, I can reach out to somebody directly on there and I can interact directly with the young person on there. Um, so the allure of YouTube type thing where I can have my own show and I can have followers and I can be famous, but I don't have to show my face, you know, that, that's appealing. Now, again, with Spoon Radio, they reached out to us and talked about, they highly monitor the broadcasts uh, really are, have a great reporting system set up in parental controls. So I feel like parents can feel safer about that, but again, have the conversation with the kid. And you know, what I might add to your list, Rick, yeah. is, and is Twitch. And, and it's obviously mm -hmm. going to be a specialized audience, but for parents who have kids who are really interested in gaming, Twitch can be very appealing because it allows you to watch people play in live, real time and there's a chat window, you can talk with other people. Um, you hear the gamer talking as if it were a YouTube video only, it's participatory. And the, the good thing about that is that kids can learn a lot. They learn a lot about the games, they learn about game strategy. The bad thing is gaming populations tend to be kind of, um, we'll call it disrespectful, whatever, but the language is pretty crude. There's a lot of sort of sexual content and sort of joking about, it isn't uh, bullying as much as it is, um, posturing, but that it is an environment where kids will be exposed to a certain amount of sexualized images, bad language, and all that. So it's one where I wouldn't, I wouldn't say to kids don't do it because there are some positives out of it, but I would want them to be prepared and I would want to understand who they were watching play. Yeah, that's a great point. And I, I did want to point out, maybe Arius, if you're able to access the chat box, um, if you go to the CyberWars CyberWise website under Learning Hubs, there's a drop down menu. The very first thing you'll find is apps. And we have a nice infographic that you can download that talks about the top apps that kids use. We have another one under gaming, which are the top games kids use. And then you'll find a Learning Hub on several of these apps as well. So again, it's under um, CyberWise Learning Hubs. Um, Aries, are you able to access the chat box? Or are you still having? I, every time I try to type in, it just kicks me off. So okay. I can keep jumping on, jumping off, but. Can you see, are you able to see it? You can't see it. I'm not, I, as soon as I open it, I just get kicked off now. I'm so sorry. Well, I do see a question. Empathy was dropping for youth before COVID. I am concerned it will drop further. Any apps or games that encourage kindness, respect, self-compassion and empathy? Great question. Do you guys know of any? Well, you know, there's all kinds of, of apps for mindfulness. Mindfulness is directly related to empathy. Um, Headspace has a whole bunch of uh, meditation guided imagery things for kids. There's all kinds of other apps like gratitude journals, sort of those exercises that you don't even need an app for. You can just have it as a family event. Everybody, you know, before, before dinner, um, you know, says what they were grateful for the day, that day, the best thing that happened, all of those things cause people to listen to each other. That all of those things have been shown to be directly related to empathy. Yeah, yeah Snapchat, so, uh, Snapchat and Headspace partnered to bring those two together because Snapchat, Snapchat's been trying to do a lot of work to help um, uh, young people with depression and anxiety and those kinds of things. So they partnered with Headspace and it's kind of a plug-in for Snapchat. So uh, kid, like if I'm having 
issues, things can come up, but then if friends of mine see something, they can suggest Headspace stuff for me as well. So it's kind of, I think Snapchat's trying to pull itself away from its roots to become much more helpful to young people in that regard. Yeah, and I think you guys know what I'm gonna say is I think the most effective way to build those skills is to teach it within the child. Um, that's really what cyber civics is about within our three year curriculum. We have so many activities and games that kids play that are empathy building and teach them how to display that via all the social media apps they use. And that is the most effective thing. I've seen kids have so much kindness on all these apps on Instagram and Snapchat and all these places. And it comes from the kid, you uh -huh. know, and if kids know to watch out for each other to, you know, maybe stand up to a bully and protect the target and all of that stuff is going to turn any app into an empathy building app. So mm -hmm. there was a question in the Q and a from Mary, uh, who's asking, how are you all staying aware of the latest apps kids are using? <laughs> well, for my part, I listen, like I'm when I'm in, I know areas, same thing. We both teach cyber civics to middle school students. So I, I try to listen to them and hear what's up and what's going on. Um, I know you guys both do the same thing and, and also parentology, your guys are covering this stuff all the time, correct? Yeah, we try. I mean, part of the reason we have a young writing staff is that they're constantly coming to me going, here's the new one that's being used because they want to get paid. But God bless them, it gets us the latest info. So there you go. Yeah, um, yeah, for me, I was going to say journalists call me up and say, what do you think about something? It's like, oh, let me look it up. <laughs> okay, right back to you. Yeah. Um, and George brought up, um, this was great. So Google's got their internet awesome activities, which yeah. also help you spot fake news and stuff. He put a link in the chat that's super, super helpful. We wrote about it on the site also, but he's sending you right to the source. So, yeah. you know, look at them and then look at parentology.com. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I, I had another question that I wanted to cover. Let's see. Oh, Pam, you, you gave us a list, like we're doing lists right now. So you gave us a list of the apps that parents worry about most. Do you want to talk about that real quick? Well, yeah. So, I mean, and maybe this is a, a conversation for another time, but it was very interesting to me that the, the studies that I were looking at, when they would list the apps that were parents worried about, they talked about it from the parents worry. They didn't talk about it from research. They didn't talk about it from what actually happened on the apps. They talked it about, you know, what, what are parents most worried about? And so it struck me that, first of all, it's good to know about apps, but there's a zillion out there. There's no way that you're gonna learn about every app. So it's really important to understand your kids and what, what you've considered their weaknesses and strengths and vulnerabilities so that you can learn about the apps that are most likely to influence them. Some parents are very worried about social comparison and they're very worried about Instagram. The solution, of course, isn't to turn them off of Instagram. It's to help build up those skills of resilience that allow them to do critical thinking, make judgments, and separate those images from self-evaluation. But I was going to say, Diana, when we were listening to all these things, I was, you know, we always say, talk, talk to your kids, right? But we've been talking a lot about empathy. There is no better way to develop empathy in your kids than to have meaningful conversations with them. Talk to them about what you're feeling. Let them talk to you about what they're feeling. Find out how their day was. It's very easy for adults to model the same behaviors that they're worried about in their kids, which is to say being preoccupied with their phones or trying to get their work done or all of those things. So it really, I think those things have gone hand in hand. It isn't just that the parents are all sitting around ready to engage and the kids are, you know, off with technology, we're all busy. Yeah. So you really have to make that time to talk, not just the hard conversations, which we always tell you, you have to have, but the ones that where you get to know each other and well, where you get you to know, understand. Parents can model this with their kids from a very early age, you know, I mean, sit a young child on your lap next to you, go through Facebook together and say, oh, this is such a nice thing that someone posted. I'm going to share it because it made me feel so happy. And then you see another article and say, God, that doesn't sound true. Let's investigate it and see if that's a true article or if it comes from a, a credible source or if it's just misinformation. And you can start modeling that and show your child. And it's funny when I looked at Pam's list of the apps that parents worry about, Personally, my biggest worry is Facebook because people are sharing so much misinformation and it, it's going unchecked. And so we have got to stem this tide. It's it's a big worry to, in my world anyway. 
Right, but that's so important that you've like, your worry is misinformation. That's super important. But if somebody else is like, I'm worried about my kid running into porn, those are completely different questions. They're not equally, you know, one's not more important than the other, but different things happen on different sites. You don't worry about porn as much on Facebook as you do misinformation. I don't worry much so much about misinformation on Mabel as I do about porn, you know? I mean, it's sort and, of- And like you said earlier, like some parents, their concern might be their child is um, you know oversharing and that privacy might be a concern. So again, to drill down what it is that's you know urging your child on to use these things and if that intersects with your concerns is, is super important. Uh, so we have a question, Rick. I'm going to let you take this one. Um, uh oh. Do parental control controls work? Do parental controls work? Um, every young person that we speak to is smarter than their parents on the parental controls. They know how to get around them. Like, like a lot of these places, a lot of companies, I should say, have done great work with trying to help parents. But kids, if kids want something, they're ingenious, they're smart, and they're more tech savvy than their parents. So the bigger question, so now I'm gonna lob it over to Pam. Um, Pam, are you, <laughs> Diana? The bigger question isn't how do parents block it? Because it's it's exactly what you say. You tell a kid no, they're gonna find a way to do it because there must be something there. I mean, my mom told us never to watch Benny Hill when I was growing up. So immediately we had to watch Benny Hill because we were like, there's something dirty going on, right? Well, same thing here. So how what's the better tool than a than a parent, parental guide? Critical thinking. I mean, yeah. you know, the, we're, the, this is where we sound like, you know, we've got this last five minutes taped that we just call out every yeah. every time. <laughs> it's like, but, I know. you know, all, the best thing you can do for your kids is prepare them with critical thinking an understanding of values and helping them make judgments. You can't expect them to never do anything stupid. That is the nature of growing up and I wish I could get over it. Um, but can prepare them to think about things thoughtfully. You can prepare them for situations by role playing so that they know what to do. And you can especially prepare them to know how when they run into trouble, how to seek solutions, reporting. I mean, Diana, you guys, I mean, first of all, you should all go to the CyberWise site because mm -hmm. there's all kinds of information on how to deal with it. But arming kids like that keeps them from feeling victimized. It keeps them empowered. I mean, uh, you're right, canned answer. You got it. This is the best parental control in the world. The thing that's mm -hmm. gonna be Rick's right. You know, anybody smarter than a fifth grader, I would say this this time of year, second grader can disable parental controls. And, you know, you wanna teach a kid to be their best parental controls and give them all the reasons why and to have them look out for each other and have this be their world is what they do. And, you know, I, I feel like a broken record, but that's what we do through cyber civics is we teach the kids all the reasons why and they start really taking care of themselves and their peers. And there's nothing more effective than that. So if mm -hmm. you don't already have a digital literacy program in your school, contact us or contact your principal and say, look, at you've got to be teaching kids this stuff because it's great to learn it from your parents. It's better to learn it from your peer with your peers. So mm -hmm. yes, because kids believe their peers. They don't believe their parents. Right. right. And like, I mean, Diana, I think you've said this to me in the past. It's similar in a sense to the climate change argument. It, you know, teaching the parents is a losing battle. You teach the kids, they'll teach the parents. Exactly. So true. Especially this stuff, because kids know that we didn't grow up with it. So they already think they're the experts. So mm -hmm. equip them with a little more knowledge and they truly will be the experts. So, um, all right. So I'm going to do our wrap up. <laughs> Pam's right. This is like same points every time, but this is really important <laughs> stuff. So listen up, people. Uh, what can parents do to protect their kids on apps like Omegle? So do you guys want to go around and give, we'll each give our, I'm going to go to Arius because you're with kids even more than I am. So what would you be your number one tip to, that parents should do to keep their kids safe? I think just having ongoing conversations and then also instilling like self pride and self-respect and dignity and maintaining privacy. I think when you have all of those skills, you're a lot less likely to bear all, you know, and including your um, age, because I know so many parents are worried about predators. So if you're giving them lo your location, you know, where you go to school, that's what I would really stress, especially is the privacy concerns. Yeah, really good point. Um, Pam. Well, I really like, um, Arias, I like your point about 
sort of self image and self regard. And I think that's where role playing can make a big difference because if you said to your kid, well, is, I'm going to do this rule and they're going, that's not fair. But if you said, well, if, if you were the parent, what would you tell your kid or what would you tell your friend or what, you know, in other words, where you switch the table so that they're having to advise someone outside themselves, we're often much harder on ourselves and have much less regard for ourselves than we do other people. And so those kinds of exercises can turn that table and allow them to see it uh, from a more caring and thoughtful place. And um, Rick, what would you say are the takeaway tips that we haven't already covered? You know, an interesting way in is um, for the parent to know about what these chat apps are, but then to ask the kid if they've heard about it. Like, have you heard about Omegle? Because I was just hearing about some people at work talking about it or whatever it is and see what they know and see what the info is. And that's a easy avenue into educating them. Mm -hmm. um, and also what Arias is talking about, talking to kids young, you know, all of the experts that we've interviewed about protecting kids to give them the, the ability to handle um, bullying, child predators, anything is to have conversations early. There are age appropriate conversations you can have that help give young people tools and a sense of self-worth and dignity that they can use and then that can be built upon later. Yeah, really good. That's such a good point that building that resilience is just so important. And a lot of that's done offline, you know, mm -hmm. Um, so I think we got, we made a list ahead of time. You wonder what I'm looking at here, but I think <laughs> we got all of them, uh, the ones that maybe I can underscore again is to have parents educate themselves on these apps so that you're coming from a place of knowledge is super important. Definitely be aware of what really young kids are doing online. There's so many kids under 13. I mean, you just heard from us, the kind of content they could run across, you know, it's one thing to have a 16 year old, see that stuff. It's another thing to have your nine year old run across it. Um, and Pam always reminds me of this. And remember, kids do this stuff because it's fun and it's a little bit forbidden, right? I mean, they're kids. Kids are normal. Kids have not changed in 100 years, a million years. Um, what else? Be aware there are strangers on all these apps. And as Arius mentioned, the personal information piece. Make sure your kids know what personal information not to share online. That's a super important one. So I think we've done it, folks. Is there anything I forgot left out? Um, and Catherine uh, brought up something. Do you see that in the chat? Oh, let's see. Resorting back to what they're educated on will come to their minds when they're placed in a situation wholeheartedly believe educating them when it is uncomfortable. Yes, education. I love ending on that note, as you can all imagine. Thus, our backgrounds. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right. Well, thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. And thank you to those who, of you who joined us today. We'll be posting this on the website. I'm actually going to clean up our show notes and share those as well. And please reach out to any of us if you, if you have, any, have any questions. You know where to find, I think, all of us at our various sites. And I do want to say that I'm particularly very excited about our next conversation, which will be on the first Tuesday of May. What is that date, by the way? The 4th of May. May 4th. May the fourth be with you. Oh. Um, we're going to talk about Instagram for kids under 13. Good idea or bad idea? So <laughs> that's going to be a really fun one. And I hope you will join us um, when we talk about that in a month. So thanks again, everyone. Have a great Thank day. You. Uh, keep those kids safe out there. And we will see you next time. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.